Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, Paul Beckman's International Flash Fiction Reading, F-Bomb, in New York City. I'm Francine Witt. Um, I can now let it be known that Paul has asked me to be the official co-host of the reading. So he'll be reading sometimes, I'll be reading sometimes, I'll be hosting sometimes. So anyway, um, just want to let you know that and welcome everybody and thank you all for being here. Um, so tonight we have a great program for you. And um, I'm going to start it off with a little icebreaker. We have um, a new book of flash fiction called Radio Water, and it's published by Roadside Press. And so I thought I'd, you know, just uh, be like um, shamelessly plugging here, as I want everybody to do, by the way. Um, how to This is um, from, from Radio Water, How to Answer a Door. Slowly, as if the other side of your life is on the other side of the door. Like the door is an and or a but, you are living a quiet life and you open the door and your ex was standing there flowers in hand. This was miles before he was your ex. This was your first date and you saw his ocean eyes and you knew you could drown in them, but you couldn't help it. Quickly, as if you have better things to do, which you do or don't, who can keep up with you anymore? Your ex left you with three squalling, no adorable kids and no way to feed them. At first, your ex showed up for circus weekends and clown weekends. You took Calgon baths, the bubbles, the phone left ringing in the other room. But then the ex remarried. The ex became exer. New family is set. So when the doorbell rings, it's a kid selling hospital candy or Sam from next door who wants to borrow the leaf blower. You answer the door quickly because kid one's Lego tantrum and kid two's cereal mess. You worry that if you don't answer, the knocking will never stop. Asking, like your mother told you, always ask, who's there, who's there? And then you said, well, you open the door, she said. No, no, you meant, what if it's a bad person like a man who says he will love you and doesn't? You should be glad a man will want you in the first place, your mother means, but doesn't say. Instead, she says you worry too much about everything and it's going to give you wrinkles. Not asking. You don't really have to. You will know if it's an emergency. There will be sirens. There will be pounding. If it's an only important but not emergency, it will continue. It will be like a man who tells you he loves you, let's get married, and he's not asking again. He will tell you to remember he, the time he took you to the ocean, and you said the water was too salty, too fishy, and that he had to con convince you to stick in a toe, and how you finally liked it. He will tell you you should listen to your mother and stop worrying about everything. He will tell you to forget that the ocean can drown you, uh, the ocean can drown you, but it doesn't do that every time. This is waiting. This is the best way to answer a door. Wait until the knocking stops. Could take years, but it will. Wait until it all dies down. The tapping, the rapping, the scraping, the swishing, the cooing, the ocean eyes, the words of love, the fear that no one will ever knock again. Thank you. And that's Radio Water. You can get it on um, Magical Jeep. Two words, magicaljeep.com or Amazon, uh, or you can find me at francinewit.com. That's my website. Hey, um, thank you all. And that was, you know, to break the ice. So uh, yeah, the first person has gone, all the drama, you know. Anyway, so let's get to our readers. As I mentioned, this is called the F-Bomb International reading. And so just to keep us honest, we have from Scotland, a very wonderful writer, Meg Pokris. Meg Pokris is the author of nine collections of flash fiction. Her work has been published in many literary magazines, which is such an understatement. I'm just 
at living there, including the New England Review, Electric Literature, McSweeney's Craft, and Elsewhere. A new collection, The First Law of Holes, New and Selected Stories, is forthcoming with Zank Books in late 2024. Meg is the founding editor of Best Microfiction. Meg Pogris. Thank you so much, Francine. It's it's great to be here with you all. Um, the first piece I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'll make mine short tonight. Um, the first piece I'm going to read is um, a piece that I co-wrote with the wonderful Jeff Friedman, who's here tonight. And uh, Jeff and I wrote a collection together called The House of Grana Padano. That came out uh, a couple of years ago with Pelicanesis, and we're working on our second collection so I'm going to read a story that Jeff and I co-wrote that appeared in the Fabulist magazine, and it's called A New Pair of Lips. A New Pair of Lips. One morning, his wife came downstairs with new lips, big and bright. Frankly, a little scary, he thought. She smiled at him, and he smiled back cautiously not knowing what her lips intended. Then, before he could react, she kissed him on his lips. Her kisses tasted like something radioactive, something that would burn in the earth for centuries after their deaths, their history together written in glowing rock. She already felt earthy, but he was made of illness, effluvium oozing from his body, his breath a fog of aerosols, she kissed him again, and he nearly fainted. What's wrong? She asked. It's just that we're not what we once were. There's something about us that is not us. She flashed her lips at him almost angrily. We're better, she said. Think of it that way. He tried to think of it that way. But in so many ways, he was much worse, less capable of keeping up with her born-again sexiness. She wrapped him in her arms and picked him up. Light as a feather, she said, I could carry you across the threshold. He looked down at her joyful face and tried to remember her great old smile, but the new smile had swallowed it. And the next story I'm gonna read is called Bill and it, it recently appeared in Passages North. It's in sections, so. Um, okay, Bill. Her husband said that an old friend would be coming to stay for a few nights. Bill, he said. She was surprised that her husband was in contact with an old friend she had never heard mention of. How many years has it been, she asked. Can't remember, he said. I didn't know you had a friend named Bill, she said. I'm sure I mentioned him before. It was true that her brain was unreliable. For example, she could no longer remember their deceased cat's nickname, but she still sang to that cat buried in the backyard, sang to her on the day of the dead, you are my sunshine, her husband's favorite song. Sad, but also happy. Draw me a sketch of Bill. If he's staying here, I wanna get a sense of him. Fine, he said. He sat down that evening and made a child's drawing of a skinny human with a dotted nose. Are those pock marks? Nope, they're nose holes. Are those big hips? No, they're just bones. You know I'm crap at this. The name, Bill. Straight ahead, simple. How easy it was to feel suspicious. The cries of a distant animal. A phone ringing late at night when her husband's phone was turned off. Somebody calling her husband, as if in a dream. Where does Bill live? New Zealand. Why is he coming? His marriage to the Greek woman is broken up. Greek woman? Yes. You know this woman? Yes. What's her name? Athena. How sad, she said, imagining a man with a dotted nose crying somewhere in the bush, imagining a man with large hips wobbling back and forth from the shock of being divorced from the goddess of wisdom. Has Athena met someone else? How would I know, her husband said. I haven't seen Bill in dog's years. Bill was a high wire act, he said. The dreams started rolling in. In one dream, freshly divorced Bill at the seaside. Bill with his large human arms. 
the smell of testosterone mingling with the scent of old shells, coconut tanning oil glowing hot on a hairy back, sunburn resistant, not like anyone else, a sand flea crawling right up to her husband's pink cheek, Bill poking it away with his lips, pulling out a bar of imported chocolate filled with absinthe cream, unwrapping it for him to nibble. I'm glad you're coming, Bill, she said, her husband moaning in his sleep, kicking her shins like a goat, waking her up. The song was playing over in her head, You Are My Sunshine, on the Monday Bill was supposed to arrive, her husband loping around in the kitchen, noshing on carrot sticks, pacing like a reduced animal. I'll cook up a pot roast, she said, his bunched up forehead. That would be too much for Bill, he said. She sat there thinking about the lyrics of the song, how the spirit of the song felt so different from divorce or death, how the love for a cat was like no other love. What time does Bill get here? I'm not sure if he's coming now, he said. He and Athena have reunited. Really, she said. A big salty tear followed the lines on his cheeks, his nose, its leaking holes, tuna noodles for dinner. She wondered about what it meant, his love for this man she had never met, a man with the world's most boring name, Bill, her growing envy toward a woman called Athena. How lucky Athena is, she thought, to love a man, leave him, and then love him again, to start over. Only the goddess of wisdom could pull that off. She puttered around the dimly lit kitchen, trying to figure out what to do with the food she had bought for the arrival of Bill. Baby rhubarb jelly, lavender honeycomb, Hava with semolina, the stuff her husband had always wanted to try, but never had the heart to admit it. Thank you. That was fabulous, Meg. Thank you, never, Francis. You never disappoint. So wonderful. And thank you for being here. Um, it's pretty late uh, where you are, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah, it after, is. But it's like after 11 p.m. Uh, yeah, but it's pretty special being here. So yeah, I'm just, you, I'm just what really a great. Trooper. <laughs> <laughs> Love having you, Meg. So thank you so much. And it is a gorgeous <laughs> reading. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Jeff Friedman. Um, oh, before Jeff, sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, I just want to give a nod to uh, my technical co-host. She's manning the uh, the technical end of it uh, tonight, Andrea Marcusa. She's doing a great job. And I just want, she'll be reading later, so you'll get to see her even more. But, um, you know, she's helping with, uh, you know, letting people in, et cetera. So I really appreciate the help, Andrea Marcusa. Okay, Jeff Friedman. Jeff is... Jeff Friedman has published 10 collections of poetry and prose and has collaborated on two books of translations. His most recent collection, Ashes in Paradise, has been published in, by Mad Hat Press. He has received an NEA Literature Translation Fellowship and numerous other awards. Jeff Friedman. Um, did we lose? Oh, there's Jeff. You're on. You're on mute, though. You're Jeff. Mute. Oh, really? You're I did my whole reading while I was on mute. I can't believe it. Now I got to start over. Start over, Jeff. Start I over. I did so good when I just read that. Um, <laughs> so, um, anyway, thank you for inviting me again, and thank you for your introduction. And uh, Meg, that was a wonderful reading as usual, uh, and it's great to. Um, be partners with Meg actually on a lot of things. And I, I was just going to, I happen to have, I have the book that we did together, House of Grana Padano, it was published by Pelicanesis Press, the wonderful Mark Givens. Um, and I'm going to put that down. And um, the first piece I'm going to read is coming from our second book. We're not quite yet at our new and selected, but we're about to get there. And um, it's um, a piece called Facts About Bald, Bald Men. And uh, in our new book, we have a sequence of bald men pieces, like 10, 12 or 14 pieces at this point. So, um, and this is set up on the page, like 
in statements separated by asterisks. So I thought I'd show you that because I'll try to make a little pause between each of the sections. Facts about bald men. Bald men flare like matchsticks, lighting up the caves around them. When they sit down to eat, their baldness sits with them. They chew so vigorously, their temples pulse. They buy fancy hats to cover their baldness, but they doff their hats and bow to show it off. When bald men put their heads together, they are like a dozen eggs cracking against each other. Occasionally, bald men discover a curl of hair growing from their thoughts. They shave off a little scalp to remove the stubble. Bald heads shine like chrome hubcaps, like Spanish onions, like scoops of vanilla ice cream, like icebergs riding high on the water, their crests melting. Bald men renounce Samson as their forefather because he was tricked into baldness. They trace their lineage to Leviathan, who had scales but no hair and ruled the primordial seas. Bald men are mirrors for other bald men, moons in a dark sky, pools of grief glistening with tiny fish. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read some um, pieces from um, my book, Ashes in Paradise, which was just published, as, as um, Francine pointed out, by Mad Hat Press, available on Amazon or for Mad Hat. And um, I think I'm going to start out with um, um, a piece called, I'm going to read a couple of pieces from um, what I call the Midrashic section and Midrash, Midrash, Mid or Midrashim, or what the rabbis used to do to retell or reinterpret uh, biblical passages or even words. They would tell a story about it to, to, to bring greater light to it for present day, you know, take the Bible and bring it up into the present. And um, it's, a, it's an old storytelling tradition. So many Jewish poets, of course, have written in it, but it's sort of essentially what you do when you write something off a fairy tale even, you know, so it's got that same kind of feel. This is, this first one is called um, Dream in the Garden, uh, and it's off the Adam and Eve and the snake story. So Dream in the Garden. Satan came to him in his dream. He handed him a large shiny apple. Take a bite and you'll know everything, he said. I'm not Adam, he answered. You've got the wrong dream. He threw the apple into the next garden, but as soon as it left his hand, another apple appeared, just as red and shiny. We're in a garden, Satan said. There's the tree of knowledge, and there's a woman with lovely breasts following you, calling you Adam. I think I have the right dream. I'm not the only guy, he replied, with a naked woman with lovely breasts in his dreams, and we're not in a garden. We're in a dream of a garden. This is my dream, Satan said. Now the woman held the apple and she was hungry. Though the man ordered her to drop the apple, she ate it vigorously and tossed the core into a bush. Delicious, she said. I'll have another. Um, the next one is going to be another Midrashic one and it's kind of a creation story. Um, or it's another take on the creation story of the creator, supposedly. And it, of course, it's informed by the pandemic and the awful unbelievably cruel and brutal Trump administration, fascistic, I might add to that one, um, and what followed. Uh, out of paradise, he conjured dust to fling into the faces of enemies and friends. He conjured the mist in which death lives. He conjured fire to scorch cities and fields, and the blaze rose into a mountain. He conjured oceans to strangle the flames and millions of arcs bobbing like buoys. He conjured driftwood and shards, rocks with animal shapes pressed into them, sea creatures whose bellies were filled with treasure, birds with covenants written on their wings. Vultures hovered, wild dogs tore at the remains. He conjured a new world in which justice reigned and his word was eternal but only his crimes survived. Uh, and last, I'll finish with, um, a, a, wow, longer than I thought. Last, I'll finish with a piece called Boy With Holes.
The officers who shot the boy repeatedly watched him fall face first, his arms and legs jerking until all movement ceased. They kept their distance, holstering their weapons, sure that it was all over. But the boy rose, his sweet face dirt stained. He walked slowly toward the officers. Light poked through the holes in his body. The ground was wet with blood. They stepped back and took out their weapons again. I've never seen anything like this before, one officer said. The other agreed. But they told him to stop and get down on his knees. The boy kept walking until he stood so close, he touched one officer on the arm. Like a breath raising the skin, his hand felt weightless. The officer cocked his gun and held it to the boy's head. Crows gathered around them. The trees rustled. The red sun flared so intensely, so intensely they had to squint to see his shape. And then the boy vanished. Now all they could see were the holes. Thank you. Oh, Jeff, that was so amazing, as always. What a Thank great you. reading this is so far. Wow. <laughs> um, th thank you very much, Jeff Friedman. Okay. Um, next, we're going to hear from Andrea Marcusa. Um, Andrea Marcusa's writings have appeared in the Gettysburg Review, River Teeth, New Flash Fiction Review, Citroen Review, and others. She's received recognition in a range of competitions, including Smoke Long, Milk Candy Review, Cleaver, and Raleigh Review. She's a member of the faculty of the Writer Studio and also studies there with poet Philip Schultz. For more information, visit andreamarcusa.com or see her on X. She actually wrote X, not Twitter, um, at D underscore Marcusa. Andrea Marcusa. Um, thank you, Francine. And it is, it's wonderful um, to be here tonight. And it's a little daunting to read after all those marvelous readers. So um, anyway, um, and, and Francine, the, the, the evening is still young. I could still really screw something up mechanically. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm going to read uh, just one um, flash, and it's called Leo. I was home alone when I heard a scary noise. My yellow cockatiel, Leo, fluffed her feathers and said, it's not a burglar. Criminals hate Northeasters, and it's raining cats and dogs. Another day, Leo told me that there's no time to tie my bed sheets together during a house fire. And since I can't fly, I should ask Alexa to order me a rope ladder from Amazon. <laughs> Last month, Leo announced that broccoli curling my hair was a huge lie, and there's no way crossing my eyes will make them stay that way. Don't believe everything everybody tells you to do, even your mom, she said. That mom's the queen of data-free analysis. Last weekend, Leo whispered that mom's friend Barbara is really a man called Bill. Remember the sales conference your mom attended last month and the crabby Mrs. Quizzard stayed here? Your mom and Bob went upstate for a romantic weekend at a B&B. This morning before school, Leo hopped onto my shoulder and said, it's okay to pretend to be sick and skip school. It's Hitchcock week on TMC. I can't math test today. Don't be such a lap dog. Those pathetic canines drive me crazy the way they're always looking for a pat on the head and waiting outside their human's closed bathroom door. It's embarrassing. Mom had already left for the office, so I stayed in my PJs and flopped on the couch with Leo on my shoulder. While we were watching Vertigo, Leo told me that Jimmy Stewart, when Jimmy Stewart runs up the Mission Church bell tower, that religion is for the birds. Man created religion. Why would God want a bunch of men in robes acting important when birds run the world? When she announced that Santa Claus was fake news, I sort of already knew this. Later, she said, you need to make some friends. You can't become one of those crazy ladies with birds when you grow up. I felt stung. I thought Leo was my pal. Usually she was a lot nicer than the kids at school, so I forgave her. 
After vertigo, we watched Rear Window. When it was over, Leo suggested making chocolate chip cookies. I'm not supposed to use the stove or oven when mom's at work. Leo gave me her one-sided stink eye and said, it bakes at 350. It's not like you're using the broiler. I took out ingredients and made the batter, pushing the spoon into my mouth as many times as I felt like. I popped them in the oven, cleaned up so there was no mess for mom to find, and then watched botched about failed plastic surgeries. Leo loved commenting on those terrible nose jobs. How dare Dr. Nassif call that man's hook nose a beak, she squawked. Smoke began filling the den. Leo, why didn't you remind me? But Leo remained quiet, busying herself with her tail feathers. I dumped the burnt cookies in the trash, opened the front and back doors to the condo to clear out the smoke and got a sweater from upstairs. Upon returning, I couldn't find Leo. I checked the living room, the bathroom where she always rested on the shower fixture. I yelled outside, Leo. I pedaled my bike around the neighborhood, calling and calling, no Leo. I posted on lost message board, uh, boards on the internet taped paper flyers to telephone poles. I left seeds on our back steps and prayed each night for her return because it's okay to pray to a being, bird or otherwise, even if religion is man-made. How could Leo have left? I thought she liked it here, enjoyed snacking on the toast corners and bits of banana I gave to her. I thought she liked me. After school each day, I expect to hear her chirping when I come through the front door, but she's gone. Watching TV isn't fun alone either. I begin looking forward to attending school because there I don't think about losing Leo. There, there are kids to talk to. When my class learned that Leo was lost, they made a card with a drawing of a bird and every kid in the class signed it. One girl, Amanda, told me about losing her cat, Skunky, last year. She began saving me a seat at her lunch table, and one day she gave me half of her red velvet cupcake. A week after Leo's disappearance, my mother finally realized that she was gone. She flew away. I tried to stop her, but she just took off out the back door. I fibbed a bit so I she wouldn't get mad. Leo always said that a fib isn't the same as a lie. Mother frowned and sighed and said, We'll get another bird. But I shook my head no. I was old enough to understand that Leo wasn't just any bird. Instead, I turned on Netflix to watch the episode of Botched where Dr. N calls the man's hook nose a beak. Mom joined me on the couch, something she rarely did. I didn't know there were shows like this, she said. Her phone was quieter, I noticed. Not so much texting. What's up with Barbara, I asked. Oh, she moved back in with her spouse, mom said. So she's been very busy. Poor mom. I looked at her and could see that beneath her sunny demeanor, she was sad. When we reached the section of the show about the man with the hook nose, I said, he can't be much of a doctor. That man's nose is nothing like a bird's beak. My mother laughed. That bird of yours had a real beak, she said. Remember when that huge bite she took out of my thumb? Then in a kinder, in a kinder tone, she said, maybe she'll come back one day. I thought about Leo. There was nothing in the world I would have loved more than to have Leo resting on my shoulder. But deep down, I knew she was gone forever. Anyway, I thought mom was really talking about Barbara, AKA Bob even though she thought she was talking about Leo. That day at, in school, Amanda had told me that it gets easier as the days go on. Outside, the birds started making a racket. I rose to see what it was about. The wind gusted outside and there in the backyard zipped a bright streak of yellow. Leo, my heart practically leapt into my mouth. But as the wind quieted, I realized it was just a yellow leaf. And now it was on the ground tumbling across the grass. I returned to the couch and scrunched up next to mom, something I hadn't felt like doing for a long time. 
Or maybe it was the other way around, that mom didn't feel like scrunching up to me. That's when I remembered something else that Leo said. She used to tell me when I felt lonely that the stronger I got, the easier it would be to be loved by someone. I didn't understand what she meant at the time, but I'm beginning to. Mom draped her arm around my shoulder and kissed me on the head. I snuggled up a bit more and leaned on her shoulder. Before I could utter another word, I was fast asleep. Thank you, Andrea. And do you just want to say something about your own personal little bird journey of late? <laughs> you want to just mention that because it's just such a uh, great story. I'm a crazy bird lady. Um, I I walk in Central Park every day, and one day I um, saw a, a cockatiel sitting on a fence. And I have a yellow cockatiel at home, and this was a gray one. And I said, what are you doing here? Because it was fall, and they're not native. And he came and he jumped on my finger. And I knew that um, a domesticated bird will only go to a stranger if they're in trouble. And so he flew away, and then he came back. And that's when I just stuck him under my coat and I took him home. And um, it turns out that he's a he and my other bird is a she and they're now falling in love. So. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, love birds, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I don't have a picture handy, but they're very cute together. Well, that's so, very wonderful you. of you, Andrea. So thank you so much for that wonderful story and for that additional story you just told us. Andrea Marcusa. Um, okay, before we go any further, I just want to uh, give a little shout out to some of the people in the audience in the Zoom room. Um, Miriam Mandel, my wonderful aunt, and Carol Sessler, my uh, wonderful cousin, are here. Karen Newberg, a very wonderful local local to New York City, poet and uh, fiction writer, Calliope Paleos, Scott Linden, who I know since first grade, which is a fair number of years ago. Um, and we sort of reconnected over at classmates.com about know, 10 years ago. And it's, um, it's really nice. And he sent me this photograph of everybody in fourth grade and we keep going through, who is that person? Who is that person? So Scott Linden. Welcome. Le Lee DeRosier, Desros uh, the wonderful um, editor of Naugatuck River Review, a wonderful uh, journal that focuses on narrative poetry. Uh, Tina Barry, and a wonderful flash fiction writer, and she's in the new issue of uh, Sopo Pojo, um, one of the journals that I uh, am flash fiction editor of, and Luella Lester. And um, so those are just a few of the wonderful people that are here in the Zoom room and welcome and thank you for being here. It really makes it much more festive to have um, kind and beautiful faces like yours. Okay, next we're going to move on to Elon Barnahama. Elon Barnahama's recent novel, Escape Route, set in 1960s New York City, explores music, spirituality, politics, and love. Bornhamma's writing has appeared in Paris Lit Up, 10 by 10 Fiction, Book City, Jewish Fiction, Drunk Monkeys, Entropy, Rough Cut Press, Boston Accent, Huff Post, Public Radio, and elsewhere. His story, Red Box, was nominated for Best of the, Fe Best of the Net 2024. Elon Bornhamma. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francine. I'm going to read a, uh, a flash piece uh, called Birthday Pie. Um, it had been 30 years since David set foot in the Empress Diner. On those occasions, when David did return to Queens, it was to see his parents and he rarely left their house. But here he was, sitting in a booth in front of two plates of pie, one apple, one blueberry. He slid a candle into the blueberry and was about to light it. That's just sad, he heard. David looked up at a woman smiling at him. Hi, David, she said. He stared for a bit. Michelle? Well, you got there. In high school, David had sat next to Michelle in trigonometry and calculus. Context, David said. I don't get back to the neighborhood much. Back from where, she asked. 
Santa Monica, and you made the trip so you can celebrate your birthday alone at the Empress. It's not my birthday, he said. You always light a candle to eat pie, she said. I haven't lit it yet. Well, don't let me stop you. David lit the candle as Michelle sat down. Don't, do we blow it out, she asked. We leave it alone and we don't eat the pie. The waitress came over and Michelle ordered a grilled cheese. We sat next to each other for two years, she said, and you barely said a word to me. I didn't talk to a lot of people back then. High school friends seemed to have fun. You were always laughing and smiling, and I wanted to know why, but I couldn't get you to tell me. What was your thing back then? You were always carrying around a book. I was into Jack Kerouac, David said. On the road was my Bible. I was a deadhead, she said. Let's not do that whole reminiscing glory days thing. It's like looking for ghosts. Ghosts are real, Michelle said. So why are you back? My mom died, David said. I'm so sorry. How's your dad? He died three years ago. I'm here to deal with the house and all of their stuff. So you'll be around for a while, she asked. The waitress brought Michelle grilled cheese and poured more coffee. Is there a lot of stuff to deal with? A lot of memories, Michelle asked. Memories are always there, but I don't get attached to things. Things don't care. I just have to find some places that will take the stuff. Is the candle for your mom? By then the candle had burned all its way down into the crust where the flame went out. So many questions, David said. He was surprised that the conversation had lasted this long. So few answers, Michelle said. Is it really not your birthday? My sister's, I do this every year on her birthday. Didn't your sister die when we were in high school, Michelle asked. If you remember that, then you also remember that Emma killed herself. I do, she said, and I remember that I tried to talk to you after that, but you became even more distant, which I had not thought possible. I was told I did not take her death well, David said. Why would you? Why should you? There were those who insisted that I should. Like who, Michelle asked. The school psychologist, for one. She talked my parents into sending me to a shrink. I didn't want to add to their grief, so I agreed. But I insisted on seeing someone in Manhattan, so there was no chance of running into them. Did it help? It did not, David said. I'm not sure why I'm telling you so much. This is how people get to know each other, Michelle said. Is that what we're doing? Why didn't it go well? Well, because he just sat there listening to me lie to him, and he never said a thing. He never challenged me, and he knew I was lying, so I quit after five weeks. Were your parents upset? Oh, I didn't tell them. I took the cash every week and put it in the bank. But I still took the subway into the city and went to the library with the lions and read. David said, it's time for your story. I don't have one. Everyone has one, David said. I went to school in the city, Michelle said, Hunter and then NYU Law. I'm a partner at a firm that does criminal law. I still live alone in Queens, and I've been sober for four years, she said. That last part, David said, there's a story there. Not an original one, more of a cliche maybe, she said. So I need to know, what'd you do with the money? I used it to move to LA after high school. What'd you do when you got there? Well, I always liked cameras and I was always making videos with my friends. Nobody back then knew much about video, so it was easy to get a job operating cameras. First I did movies, then television, and then sports. I worked at ABC Sports and traveled around filming everywhere. I loved it. I didn't stop working. I I never, I worked nonstop for a long time, saved the money, and now I'm done working for others. So you're happy, Michelle said. That's not something that interests me, something and not something I think about. We've become obsessed with happiness. We've decided that unhappiness is a flaw. I'd rather focus on things that interest me. That's crap, Michelle said, but you'll tell me about more about it tonight. And I'll tell you why ghosts are real. Tonight, Michelle stood. I need to run, but you should come out with me tonight. I'm going to a party for a colleague who just made partner. We'll pass by, and if you hate it, I'll take you to dinner. I don't see that happening, David said. You'll have fun, Michelle said, as she put $10 on the table. I'll meet you at the subway on Continental at 7.30. I think after I leave, you'll realize that I interest you, and you'll be there. She said as she turned and left the diner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilan Bornahama. That was wonderful. Next, we're going to hear from Austin Alexis. 
Austin Alexis um, is the author of Privacy Issues, Broadside Lotus Press, 2014, and two previously published chapbooks from Poets Wear Prada. He has published in Westchester Review, American Book Review, Crosswinds Poetry Journal, Flash Boulevard, 10 by 10 Flash Fiction, and he received first prize in the Great Weather for Media Flash Fiction of the Month contest. And I just parenthetically want to say, um, Austin lives here in New York City, and we hang out quite often, and um, he's just a really beautiful person, Austin Alexis. Thank you so much, Francine. Thanks for this reading. So I'll read two really short flash fictions. The first one only takes about three minutes to read, and the second one only takes about a little more than a minute. The first one is called The Operation. Erin must submit to an operation to save her eyesight. Her elderly father forbids the procedure on religious grounds. His faith, which Erin also weakly believes in, doesn't allow blood transfusions, something that will be necessary, they believe, if the operation is performed. Without her father's love and approval, Erin is an evergreen branch severed from its bark and in danger of losing its scent and vitality. She needs his financial help, but even more, she craves his sanction. The squeeze his hand gives her when he decides to show he's proud of her. Yet without her vision, her keen and voracious eyes, Erin will be cut off from her life as a painter, from the act of painting, the one activity she believes she was born to do. Her tubes of acrylic paint are rubies to her, emeralds even. In the church-like quiet of her doctor's office, she explains her dilemma to Dr. Eldridge. Like a crystal ball, his bald head glows as he listens to Erin. Sitting, she leans toward this physician she's known for 28 years since she was a child. I'll perform the procedure without the use of transfusion. That can be done. I know how, the doctor says. Showering Erin with a stare, he asks, you don't believe me? I believe you. I, I trust your expertise and respect your love for your profession, Erin says, stammering a bit. Rapture tends to make her nervous. And your religion? The doctor's question trails off. It's really more my father's religion and my dead mother's. Anyway, don't worry. Your sight won't be blurry anymore, won't be fading day by day by day. It'll be restored to 2020. Dr. Eldridge swallows the way he usually does when he's happy. Erin rushes to her dad's neighborhood to tell him the news. He lives in an area immune to gentrification. It takes courage for her to brave dangerous blocks that have improved becomes safer and more attractive, only slightly from its condition when she was a girl. Wrought iron gates, some in good shape, some needing paint jobs, line the streets. The weather is spring-like and autumn-like at the same time. A breeze pushes against her as she hoofs her way from the subway to her dad's place on Pitkin Avenue. She enters her father's apartment, tells him the doctor's news, which is her news, her salvation. In a burst of joyous endorsement, he kisses her cheek and then claps her hands. But abruptly, instinctively, Erin pulls her hands away, understanding she will never again love this man as much as she loved him before her diagnosis.
And the other one, the really short one, the exit. The train jerked to a halt too abruptly. After catching her breath, Naomi took slow strides out of the subway car and headed down the grimy platform toward the exit. As she approached the departure turnstile, a bulky man who was her ex-lover, accompanying a woman who wore a gorgeous gray suede coat, pushed through the steel bars to enter the station fully. The coat collar flapped like a graceful swan wing. Naomi's lips tightened as the two she observed who were unaware of her, turned left and strolled arm in arm down the platform in the opposite direction of Naomi. Their backs faced her. We just missed a train, she heard her ex-lover say to the woman. Naomi opened her mouth to call to her ex-lover, but then stopped herself. Instead, she busied herself by adjusting her green scarf, a new scarf that had quickly become her favorite accessory. She adored the way it caught the wind, the way it flew free of her neck and shoulders and never became tangled. She liked how lightweight it was, how feathery. She stroked the sheer fabric her next impulse was to keep stepping quickly without glancing around. She did so as she smiled and pushed through the exit bar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Austin Alexis. That was wonderful. I hope everybody's looking in the chat because, you know, when you read and you don't see all the great comments coming up about your, uh, your work. So please, I encourage everybody to put comments in the chat or if you've read to look at it and, um, you know, it's it's nice. And I want to also, so Austin Alexis, and thank you very much for reading for us tonight. I also want to um, recognize a few other people here in the Zoom room, Joseph Moralia, Peter Mladnik, Daniel, Daniel Snether, Snethen, John Park, David Bright, Grace Clifford, Sarah Holloway. I see all of you and I'm grateful that you're here. So welcome. Okay, next we're going to hear from Michael C. Keith. Michael C. Keith is the author or co-author of more than two dozen groundbreaking books on electronic media, including one chosen by President Clinton for his official summer reading list. That's pretty impressive. Beyond that, he is the author of the acclaimed memoir, The Next Better Place, Algonquin Books, a young adult novel and 25 story collections, www.michaelccheith.com. Michael C. Keith. Thank you, Francine. Uh, I'm going to read uh, from a couple of new books. Uh, first, uh, from Euphony, uh, due out next week from, uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, uh, from Bamboo Dark Press. Uh, so let me start. The first one's called uh, Days Without Meat. It wasn't a meal to 13-year-old Ernie Ferris without beef or pork. It was the way he and most kids were raised in the 1950s. The only time he had lunch without one or the other was when his mother made him peanut butter and jelly for school. That was acceptable to him. Some kids had tuna salad sandwiches on Friday because they were Catholic, and that was not acceptable to him since he hated fish. He was very thankful his family was not religious and knew how to feed their children. This is called Modified. In her fifth grade grammar class, Madeline was daydreaming when her teacher explained the meaning of dangling participles. This gap in her knowledge had no small impact on her adult life. And this one is called The Wizard of Trash. See if you can figure out who I'm talking about. 
the Wizard of Trash. He had a way with words. He could shape them in a manner that would excite racists and the profoundly uneducated. In time, he built a following which supported his bid for the highest office in the nation. To the surprise and shock of those capable of reason and compassion, he won the vote and proceeded to abolish the honor and integrity on which the country was founded. This made his legion of disciples happy as a dead pig in the sunshine. This is uh, from a forthcoming book uh, down the line a few months, uh, if you see it. Uh, this is called, uh, the book is called The Loneliness Channel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remembering what wasn't. Marvin sensed he missed out on several opportunities for a meaningful relationship, one that may have changed his life in substantive and important ways. Not just a relationship with a woman, but with a man as well. A man who may have become his best friend. He'd missed out on a significant relationship with a pet, too. He wondered who and what they would have been. This woman, this man, this pet. He grieved their loss and lit votive candles in his church to commemorate their having never existed. The older he became, the more he felt their absence. This one is called His Best Friends. Sam Ricketts had been an assistant embalmer at the Picard Funeral Home in Idaho, Idaho Falls for 27 years. As he had no family or close acquaintances, his social circle consisted of the bodies he would slip to his remote cabin until they were scheduled to be worked on. Since he also served as the funeral parlor's hearse driver, it was easy for him to borrow clients for a day or two. What he most liked about having cadavers as companions was their willingness to let him talk. And next is whatever gets you through the day and night. The loneliest he ever felt was right before he discovered the loneliness channel. It was a life-saving moment to know there were so many other people bereft of companionship and as miserable as he. Just watching the streaming network made him feel so much less isolated and insignificant. He also was happy to pay the extra fee for its soft porn option, Lonely Tarts. And finally, his teeth in a jar by the door. Maynard was a 60s child, and his passion for the Beatles held fast his entire adulthood. One song in particular played on loop in his mind through the decades. Of all the affecting music by the Fab Four, Eleanor Rigby served as his life's soundtrack. Now in the twilight of his years at the Monmouth House nursing home, he waits at the window for visitors who never come. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. That last piece really got me. That was just really beautiful and, and just oh, heartbreaking. And I think we all know who you were talking about earlier. So. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> that was great. Thank, wonderful reading, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. Michael C. Keith. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Bill Merkley. Bill Merkley's work has appeared in numerous journals and was included in Best Microfiction 2021 and nominated for Best Small Fictions 2022 and 24. Most recently, he was long listed for the 2023 Smoke Long Grand Micro Competition and short listed for the 2024 Beth Novella in Flash Award. Bill Merkley. <laughs> Thank you, Francine. Um, I'm going to read an older story that was first published in Ghost Parachute, and then later Francine was kind enough to run it in Flash Boulevard. Um, I can't remember if I ever read this at, at F-Bomb before, but that's okay, because it's Groundhog Day, 
So if I repeat myself, it goes with the day. And this is called Portugal. Your son zips from room to room, gathering his beach things. The aroma of fried bacon and sunscreen fills the small bungalow. For the umpteenth time, you remind him to eat something and to take some bottled water. He'll be out the door before you have a chance to change. When it was the three of you, experiences were more important than things. That hasn't changed now that you are two. Out on the porch, your son is leaning over the railing in a vain attempt to see the water. He's taller this summer, but still a little boy, still years away from puberty. That feels like a blessing. Some boys from across the street ask him to join them. You tell him to stay here. He lugs two folding chairs while you shoulder an overstuffed bag and umbrella past the small, coarse lawns of the residence, the gravel yards of the rentals, past low fences and sandy switchgrass, then up and over the dunes. You set up near the lifeguard, check the chalkboard hanging off her white wooden perch. The tide is coming in, the water is chilly. For now, your son is content to dig in the sand and bury your feet. You are content to sit under the umbrella and let him. It's appalling how some parents are dozing or reading while their kids run so far afield. The surf looks rough. You grip the arms of your chair as you watch other children cavort in the waves. The water is dark green. It hides an express lane between you and every deep sea creature that ever haunted your childhood dreams. Oarfish, giant squid, leathery sunless freaks with hollow eyes and saber teeth, dim phosphorescent lights sprouting from their heads. These thoughts bring an uneasy laugh. You know we all came from the sea, but now, unless you can swim like a dolphin, you are at its mercy. And yet, you could sit here and gaze at the expanse for hours. The rhythms are soothing, the dance of sunlight on the water, the syncopation of the surf, the rise and fall of seabird calls, the background hum of people modulated by the changing wind. You dare not let it lull you to sleep. Where would you end up if you could swim out in a straight line without stopping, you ask, when you were seven, you could name every country on a blank map of the world. He shrugs his shoulders and you say Portugal. This means nothing to him. How do you know, he says, I don't see anything. I just do. The hollowness of that pat parental response sits in your chest. He continues to pile sand on your feet. Of course, you say, nobody can swim that far. He treats this like a dare and runs for the water. Sand flies as you scramble after him. In the shallows, you make yourself a buffer between him and the deeper ocean, watching him splash and grab for broken shells as the sea tries to reclaim them. You are ready to scoop him up, should the sea try to claim him too. Each retreat of a spent wave makes you step back to regain your footing. Now, knee deep, you gauge how far you are from the lifeguard. On shore, a round white man with red arms and plaid shorts points beyond your shoulder. Before you can turn, a surge of water throws you on top of your son. He's writhing, drowning beneath you. Cold waves push you down. Desperate for traction, your hands and knees sink in the shifting sand. Finally, you pitch back against the surf and lift him in one graceless motion. He gasps and coughs, yells and punches your arm. This gets the attention of the lifeguard as you stumble out of the water, but only for a moment. Under the umbrella, your teeth tingle and your heart pounds. He pulls a towel around his wiry body, so much like yours at that age. You brush sand from his wet blonde mop. It's yours too, and will probably be brown by the time he is in high school. Those soulful hazel eyes are not yours. The originals still come to you in dreams. He looks away. Apologies are not accepted until the ice cream truck arrives. 
You stand dripping with the towel over your shoulders. His popsicle is dripping over his hand. The boys from across the street run up and ask him to play frisbee. You give him the slightest of nods. He hands you the stick, wipes his hands on your towel. With halting breath, you watch him take off down the beach. Clasping the towel across your chest, you steal a glimpse of the hazy blue horizon, beyond which are Portugal, your grown son diving headlong into waves and emerging on the other side, you sleeping in the sand. Thanks. Oh, Bill, that was just gorgeous. Thank you for that reading. Uh, and really just take a look in the chat to see how many people agree with me. So thank you very much, Bill Merkley. And I've actually, am I frozen? No. Okay. Um, I actually have met Bill in person because uh, originally, the F bomb reading was um, at the KGB here, the, the KGB bar, which is a very famous literary bar in on the Lower East Side. And Paul would come down from Connecticut, and we had it there like once a month on first Friday, like tonight, and it was great. But then, of course, COVID, da -da -da, you know, and so he went to Zoom, and I, for one, am awfully glad he did because it's nice to have it in the bar but this is nicer because we get much more uh much more variety of flash fiction writers and a lot of times you know um one of the beauties of this reading in particular for me because i'm having a great time i hope you're all having fun but um it's like it's so nice to you know, the people that interact with you online all the time, like, you know, if you have something published and then people comment on it and then when they publish something, they comment on it. And then to see them and hear them read, um, not in person, but pretty close to it, you know, so I, I love that. And our next reader, I do want I do want to say um, I went to AWP in Seattle <coughs> last year. And one of the, my motivation for going was to meet Patricia <laughs> because we had been in, during COVID, we had been in this writing group together. We met every Saturday night, called, we called the, the Flash Monsters. And then it sort of just kind of, you know, frittered away as things do after COVID and you can see each other in real life. But uh, we met in person uh, and we had lunch and probably one of the best pieces I ever had um and i say that as a new yorker so yeah. so our next reader patricia quintana bedar is a western writer from los angeles her work is included in flash fiction america it's a norton anthology by the way just saying best small fictions 2023 and best microfiction 2023 patricia's collection of short works Pardon Me for Moonwalking is forthcoming in December 2025 from Unsolicited Press. She lives with her family, an unusual dog, outside of Oakland, California. Patricia Bedar. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. I want to echo what Francine said. Uh, I have met so many wonderful people in this reading series in the past I don't even know how many years it is anymore. I honestly do not remember. Four, I guess. I'm probably. literally talking about the pandemic. I don't remember yeah, anymore. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my lot. mind. Yeah. <laughs> During the pandemic, I lost my mind. But I did meet a lot of um, fantastic writers, in, including Francine in person in Seattle. And here I am, you know, 3,000 miles away from many of you. And I'm, I'm all for these Zoom readings. I, I really love them. Uh, I'm going to read two uh, uh, short pieces of Hush. One is called Liars, and the other one is called Mother's Day. So here goes. <clears throat> Our mother took us to see great-grandma Rosa and her best friend Isabel. Rosa had recently lost her longtime beau, Big Pete Zamora. Isabel's husband died years before, Liver. Now the two women lived in adjoining bungalows in Parched Canoga Park. 
I was struck by the curved concrete walkway embedded with crockery, the chickens in back. On the way, our mother had told us that Isabel put needles taped in the shape of a cross above the door to her bedroom. This was because the devil came and had sex with her at night. Great Grandma Rosa fixed us tortillas she'd made and scrambled eggs from the chickens out back. The yolks were a sunny goldenrod shade. We asked about the two silent men walking from the backyard to the front, and my mother translated Isabel's answer. She rented a couple of rooms to the wetbacks. Great-Grandma Rosa was religious in her old age. She kept her rosary in her dress pocket. Maybe it was Isabel's influence, but she'd hung up her dancing shoes for good when Big Pete died. He was fat, and his legs were made of wood, but he could really move. When we went to dinner at McDonald's that night, great-grandma Rosa asked me if I'd finished my burger, and I told her yes. Really, I'd hidden half of it in the wrapper. With her apple doll mouth, Isabel muttered that all liars went to hell. She said this in Spanish. Our mother translated, trying not to smile. After we dropped the ladies off, I watched the widows in their black dresses totter the winding path to great-grandma Rosa's door. As my mother and brother bickered over the radio dial, I watched the silhouette of the two women locked in an embrace behind Rosa's bedroom drape. Mother's Day. I'm writing this letter to you on Mother's Day, an assignment of sorts. Capable hands care for me. Musical speech provides the backdrop to my days. Tagalog, the language is called, but you would know that. I had to ask. One nurse in particular, she'll talk to me. Nurse Camilla is the one who said it's time to write you a letter. She serves as my amanuensis as well as my carer. She even bought the stationery, white with yellow roses. Do you remember how in the old days motels had a little drawer with a few sheets of stationery, envelope or two? Or maybe you were born too late for that. Here are the words Carmela writes at my request with her teal inked pen. Place me on a mountaintop, a sky burial in a tower of silence. Let the elements first take me, then the carry-on birds. Carmela looks sideways at me to see if I'm joking. She says these words are probably against religion, and the rest is up to me. I was born in 1940, <clears throat> you in 1976. Dragons, according to the Chinese zodiac. A community of two all those years, a clutch a nest, no father, no brother, no husband or swarm of sticky cousins, no Easter egg hunts or barbecues or sprawling Christmas eves. Our apartment rang with silence. You were a future butterfly counting the days of a pupa. We stayed curled around our books. Later you forayed into other families, the families of your friends, but it was always temporary until you turned 18 and left, just as I did at the same age. I was left with your dog, your birds, your butterfly garden. The monarchs are drawn to the milkweed in pots on the balcony. Carmilla's children's, children are at home while she works. Twin aunties care for them. Her family all live within one mile of, another, of one another. Imagine, later today they will gather to honor all the mothers. One more time, I would like to regard the Pacific Ocean constant my entire life, like a heaving green mountain. Here, I am close enough to catch the marine scent on the morning, morning wind. Carmilla knows I like my window wide to the elements. Some bird song, a butterfly, higher than high as the, sky go, as the song goes. The one that will always remind me of you. You left like a butterfly, guided by your cells. But we are not flutterers, you and I, only scaly and strategic. I regard you from across 3,000 miles, across the purple mountain's majesty, the amber waves of cranes. Irma suggested adding that. I will not really be pedestaled on a mountaintop to be devoured by birds. I am no Zoroastrian. I trust Carmilla to handle it all and take away my earthly possessions, as she has agreed. 
but do think of me as you regard your mountains so very far from here, or the surging Atlantic, or the coconut palms, or steel cylinders scraping heaven, whatever you have where you live, from one dragon to another, mother. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Patricia, um, Patricia Bedar. And um, that was really gorgeous. Like your usual facility with imagery. Um, it's just amazing. Um, so uh, next we're, next up, we have um, Karen Schauber. Karen Schauber's Flash Fiction. Has, re has received nominations for Pushcart, Best Small Fictions, Best Microfiction, and the Wigleaf Top 50. She curates Vancouver Flash Fiction, which is a wonderful uh, resource, really. Um, you know, she has these um, uh, people like giving tips every, every week or so, and it's really wonderful. And in her spare time is a seasoned family therapist, and she's got an adorable dog, Hunter. <laughs> Read her at Karen Schober Creative .com. Karen Schober. Thank you, Francine. I'm going to read a micro. Uh, this micro is new, so I actually don't even have a title for it. If anybody has an idea, I'd welcome that in the chat. He waves at me with that sawtooth smile and halloumi complexion, and I swoon just like the last time. Last guy, my bus leaving in 10, but I jump up and squeeze past the bulky woman seated next to me, her closed loop reusable plastic bag bulging with a thick baton of Hungarian salami, fragrant spicy olives and pungent Brinza, Limburger and Epoise cheeses. She mentions meeting her beau for a picnic by the lake him bringing the libation and the worsted wool blanket as I zoom to the front of the bus begging the driver to let me off. And I don't even want a refund, I just need to get off. Hiram is perplexed, but willing to indulge as I force his arms open for the hug of a century. I'm squeezing so hard he issues a little cough. But I don't let go because I think I found what I've always been looking for and realize that I can make the Carpathian Mountains my home after all. I'll learn to sew pretty embroidered blouses and sell them at the market, cook on a cast iron wood stove. And who needs a Dyson anyways when sorghum grasses can work just fine to rid, rid an earthen floor of dust? And I've always loved animals of all kinds, loved visiting zoos in every major city I've traveled to, waited in line in the oppressive heat, my tortoiseshell glasses slipping down my nose and my mornings blowout frizzing up to tether a slip of lettuce to a giraffe, its long neck billowing while its thick black tongue darts in and out reaching for the tasty morsel. Happy to share my salon with a few naked ne neck turkin, yielding enormous fresh down dark brown eggs, and in colder weather, transform my dwelling into a bear, pushing aside the sofa to accommodate a bearded goat or two. Hiram is gripping me firm by the shoulders, looking stern, not delighted or loving as I expected his big mitts bracing me, or him, I'm not sure. But I am so full of effervescence, I can see he sees the potential, and that this mail-order bride might just work out. That's it. Oh, Karen, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And your writing is always so filled with lush imagery and, and great descriptions and also uh, you never disappoint. Thank you so much, Karen Schauber. And I just want to say Karen did the beautiful poster that I put on Facebook. She she put that together. Thank you so much, Karen, for that. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, 
one of the regulars here, and you'll see why she's just such a favorite, um, Cindy Rosmus. Cindy Rosmus is originally from the Ironbound section of Newark, New Jersey, One vote, once voted the unfriendliest city on the planet. And it shows in her writing. She's published seven collections of short stories and is the editor, art director of the crime fiction webzine, Yellow Mama, Cindy Rosmus. Hi guys. So happy to read with you tonight. I'm inspired by all of you. I'm gonna read a story called, it's from one of my, my collection from, um, it's not published yet. I'm looking for a publisher for it. My Atlantic City 1972 stories. This one is called Toast Jello Tea. Oh, Mon Cherie, I understand. Oh, I feel your pain. At Cup of Joe's we were, the all-night diner, next to Howard's dad's hotel, and a booth by the window. Simone, a French-Canadian guest, was old and funny-looking, but she was somebody to eat with. It was really late. In the Victorian room, Marco and the mustaches had finished off a set. My mom, in royal blue gown and turban had snuck off with the keyboardist, a sneering little creep. Curly-headed Howard, love of my life, was flirting with Marina in the hotel lobby. Near the ancient cage elevator she ran. She was 14, our age, but super tall, with legs longer than my whole body, shiny black hair she could sit on. But Howard, I thought, blinking back tears, we had a date, didn't we? You're special, he'd said that first night as we made out on the mezzanine. That plum velvet couch we just sunk into. Not like most chicks, smart, but not annoying smart. I know I beamed. I like that, he breathed. And these, he squeezed my breast. Down there, I felt wild and hot. See you later, Pam, he said as I rushed past them. Men, Simone said as I reached for the search for the waitress. They need to, how you say, be in control. Your little Howard already thinks he's a big man. Yeah, I thought bitterly. Well, we showing his dick to somebody because his dad owned the place he got away with shit. Oh, Pam, he'd wave it at me, but I'd look away. Pam the prude, because I'm still a virgin, he calls me that. I confided in Simone. But I'm only 14. Ah, she smiled like I'd said 40. Maybe the language thing. 14, I repeated. One, four. When I was your age, she said, I had many lovers. I signaled the waitress. Huh? Simone looked 60-something, plain with gray hair and corny glasses, like an old man. At a nearby table, a song came on the mini jukebox. The Hollies. Lone cool woman in a black dress. Marina and Howard... Yeah, the waitress said. My stomach growled. I'd wanted the Cup of Joe special, corned beef on rye with coleslaw and Russian dressing. But now I pictured Howie with Marina, him toying with her share-like hair. What you want? Impatiently, the waitress tapped the order book with her pen. Simone was staring outside like she forgot we were supposed to order. The special, I said, imagining choking on coleslaw. Toast, Simone told the waitress. Jello and tea. Jacques, his name was Jacques. Simone piled cherry jello onto a slice of plain toast. Her tea she took black without milk or sugar. He had a wife and many children, but he loved me most, he said. As she nibbled the corner, her eyes looked wet. But he ran away with all that I had. Money, I thought. Self-respect and appetite. Right outside, a couple strolled past, arms around each other. A guy with cherubic golden curls and a tall. And my filth, the coleslaw stayed, so I watched them duck into the hotel entrance. I swallowed hard. So since then, I said, all you eat is... Yes, smiling, she picked up her tea. Till he comes back. Somehow I knew they'd be in there. I had waited too long for the elevator. From the lobby, I'd heard Howard's dad yell, Last call in the Victorian room. That felt like an hour ago. Simone had taken the stairs. 
come, she said, walk with me. I shook my head. My mom, I was sure, was in the keyboardist's room, not ours. I wasn't scared I'd walk in on them. When the elevator finally came down, I saw Howard behind the glass. Though the cage hit his expression, his head jerking back told me what was happening. I'd seen it before. Unseen, Marina was on her knees, sucking his cock, like those blonde French Canadian girls he dumped me for, because I was Pam the Prude. I backed away, hoping they wouldn't see me. By the time the elevator door opened, I heard slobbering, slurping, him gasping. Oh, yeah. Ooh, baby. Her giggling. In silent tears, I bolted up the stairs. Cheap fuck, my mom said, a cup of Joe's next morning. Don't even buy his day at breakfast. I didn't answer. What's up your ass? For a change, she seemed concerned. Hungry? I shrugged. Well, I want the works. Omelet, home fries, and pancakes with lots of syrup and butter. The bottle was caked with syrup from hours before. The sticky sweet smell made me gag. I thought of Howard's thing dripping into, dripping into Marina's mouth. What about you, Mom said, as the waitress, different from last night's, looked annoyed. Just some toast, I said softly. And tea. That's it? I shook my head. Um, do you have cherry jello? The waitress just looked at me. For breakfast, Mom said. I forced a smile. Yes, breakfast and lunch and probably. No man is worth it, Mom said. Thank you. Oh, Cindy, you never disappoint. That was so fun. <laughs> um. Cindy Rasmus, everyone. Next, we're going to hear from Brad Rose. Brad Rose is the author of five collections of poetry and flash fiction, Lucky Animals, No Wait, I Can Explain, Pink X-Ray, Detonations, and Momentary Turbulence. Word in, what, Word in Edgewise is forthcoming. Brad is also the author of seven poetry chapbooks, among them, Democracy of Secrets, an evil twin is always in good company. And funny you should ask, his website is, for some reason that got cut off, Brad. So what, what is your website? I'm sorry. It's uh, www.bradrosepoetry.com. Great. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Brad Rose. Thanks, Francine. Um, and thanks to all these readers are really fabulous. And Francine, congratulations on your new book. You must not forget. Thank um, you. I'm going to read three pieces if you're lucky and four if you're unfortunate. First one's called Mariners. Saturday rained so hard I had to paddle my rowboat to my swimming lesson. Free time can be a dangerous thing. But I like to put my feet up just like they did on the first class deck of the Titanic. Although I don't know if those de desperate cries for help were a shout out or a greeting, I poured on a little sweet talk like I usually do and hoped for the best. Like altruistic self-compassion, there are two sides to every story. As for me, everything goes in one ear and out the other, which is why it's particularly prudent to have only three main points, like the Bermuda Triangle. Do you see those love-struck molecules all the think tank pundits have been chattering about? They say they're just a thought experiment, but I'm going to wait until after the inquest to make my final judgment. No use jumping to conclusions. As far as I'm concerned, the whole kit and caboodle should be buried in a pet cemetery, too sweet. Valentine's Day is just around the corner, you know. Whenever I travel, I like to travel incognito. It's part of my risk management strategy. Nonetheless, you'd be surprised at the number of people who are willing to talk to you when you're wearing fuzzy slippers and a day glow fright wig. There's no accounting for taste, even if El Nino explains the recent uptick in the sale of indoor, indoor, outdoor life jackets. Like Captain Ahab said, I know not all that may be coming, but be it what it will, I'll go to it laughing. Better luck next time, Quee Quig. Missing Bodies. When there's nothing on, on I watch TV with my eyes closed. Why eat when you're not hungry? Of course, there's always an element of chance, you know, like the yin and the yang. 
Last week, I nearly forgot how to sleep. The rain was as cold as ice cream, and the lake was as hollow as an empty box. So in the future, I'm betting on having some lucky daydreams, the kind without the ball-peen hammers and the spooky barking. Sure, I've had some legal issues, but no matter how bad I am, there's always someone somewhere who's worse. I get told them down at the station. They'll probably never find those missing bodies, let alone the heads. Next year, if the days are randomly distributed just like they were this year, I'll plan on seeing you right here, right about this same time. Be sure to wear your red hat and bring a shovel. No need to pack a lunch. Suburb. I prefer the peace and quiet of a warm, cozy house with a fireplace and a big dog roasting on a spit. Why be yourself when you can be someone else? Athletics isn't just for athletes, you know, especially now that everybody is their own web page. You can succeed in the real world or the other one if need be. Of course, there's nothing worse than a 10-headed snake, but it depends on how you define intelligence, just as long as it's dark and busy. Yesterday, I was strolling past some anesthetized lawns like those in the rich people movies. Just by using my brainwaves, I could tell that the houses were filled with ironclad husbands and UFO-adjacent children. The horse stables were neat as a pincushion. Thanks to science, it's a whole new world out there, so I'm certain we're all going to get our day in court. Be sure to bring a blunt object of your choice, and don't forget your tenter hooks. It'll be like a block party. The flames are sure to cooperate, and the combustible furniture, although lifelike while burning, won't feel a thing. The last piece is, um, it's only 70 words long. It's called One of a Kind. Eating my slow food fast like a snake. I'm on my own schedule. It helps to be in an electrical mood. There's something about the flow of electrons that makes me want to, be, to bite something as big as a fridge. Some people say I have a Walmart smile, but I'm between jobs and looking for answers. Everybody thinks they're one of a kind. Medical studies show they might be right. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Oh, that was wonderful. Just so that was so typical, Brad Rose, um, which is witty and funny and mind bending, really. Um, I actually first discovered Brad. Uh, at this reading some years ago. I had never heard be him before. And, um, you know, Paul had him on as, as one of the readers and I thought, wow, he's great. So I hope I hope you've all heard great things tonight. Um, we're not done yet, but anyway, that was Brad Rose. And we do have one more reader and then I'm gonna read something by Paul. Um, Gloria Mindock, is editor of Trevena Barber Press. I hope I said that right. She is the author of Grief to Touch by the Sky at Night, winner of the International Impact Award. Her book, Ash, won seven book awards, and it's a wonderful book. She is the author of six poetry collections and two translations. Her poems have been published and translated into 11 languages. Gloria Minda. Thank you so much, Francine. And what a wonderful night. Everybody is just, wow. <laughs> so um, this first one is called Monster. This path is walked on by many, myself included. It is a shortcut to get home for me. Sometimes I am alone on this path with beautiful trees, plants, a full-fledged woods. I take the route before 5 p.m. It was 4.45 p.m. and I decided to take a shortcut. It would be okay. A white van was parked off the trail, almost hidden by the trees. Later in the news, there was a report of a murder on the path at 5 p.m. The whole town was nervous and on guard. At the end of the week, they found another body of a girl north of town. This did not help matters. Everyone was freaking out. One day while walking home, a man jumped out of the bushes. He said, what do you think I'm going to do? Murder you? I ran. No one was outside in their yards to ask for help. I cut through a field to get to my house and fell, getting grass stains on my pants. Worried that he would catch up to me, I got up and continued running as fast as I could. 
Once home, I locked the door to keep the monster out. The murders were never solved. I moved away knowing it could have been me. Stop. I worked in a mental institute for the criminally insane. Let's call it a jail. The patients were so drugged up, I never worried about my safety. I was a psychiatrist and responsible for medicating everyone. I only took the job because I lived close by. In 20 minutes, I could be there. The grounds surrounding the building was huge with many roads and many stop signs. They were not needed. It was stupid, but still I obeyed the stop signs and stopped. One night, I was overly tired and decided no stopping, damn it. No one will know. First stop sign, nothing happened. Second stop sign, nothing happened. Yippee, I'm home free. When I went through the third one, sirens went off. The security police stopped me. They made me get out of the car, searched me in the car, but found nothing. I told them who I was, but that did not make a difference. They told me to open the trunk. Inside was a patient. How did he escape? How did he get in my trunk? How did he know what car trunk to get into? His name was Sean and he had violent tendencies. He beat up his girlfriend, nearly killing her. And two years ago, he stabbed his doctor 25 times in an outpatient setting. The police removed him from the trunk, put handcuffs on him and treated me like a suspect helping him escape. After everything was cleared up, I was so relieved. Not stopping saved my life, so should I obey the signs or not? Once home, I took a shower, and all I could think of is the shower scene in the movie by Alfred Hitchcock. I got into my PJs wondering how was I going to sleep. After checking my house from head to toe, making sure all the doors were locked, I laid down turned off my bedroom lamp, laid there thinking, what did I do with my keys? Thank you. Wow, Glow, that was just amazing. Uh, like your style is so great. Just, you know, it's so like, you don't, you don't uh, see all those, it's like explosions coming, you know, uh, beautiful. Great work. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you so much for reading here tonight. Um, Gloria Mintock. Um, I want to just close with Paul was going to try to be here, but we couldn't quite get him on. So I will read a story for him. And uh, his new book is Becoming Mursky by Trevena Barber Press. But I'm not going to read a story from that. I'm going to read one from Kiss Kiss, which um, he published a few years ago. And when he had a launch. Uh, at KGB, an in-person launch when this came out. And I read this story because I think it's my favorite Paul Beckman story. It's just so Beckman, you know, and I think we all know what that means. Honey and Darling. I hear them whispering to each other over dinner. My dining area backs to theirs. Um, sorry. Uh, backs to theirs, and for some reason, in one small section of the wall, I can hear everything. I found it by accident with one of those previous tenants. Perhaps when the building was built, the insulation was left out or the builders did something intentionally to cause this. It only works one way, them, to me. I'm sure of that and would bet my life on it after living here for th through four other tenants. He calls her honey and she calls him darling and their mailbox name is slot the uh, mailbox name slot is blank they're cautious and only talk to each other in whispers obviously they must know that the walls in the building are thin but they can't know how thin in this one spot i might as well be in their room with them i keep my table next to the wall and eat my dinner when they have theirs listening to them share their day's experiences and more I heard Honey tell Darling about a company that her company was was about to, to buy, so I bought stock and made several thousand dollars. 
She used the boss's secretary. Another time, she told him about a stock was about, that was about to tank. I shorted it and made even more. There may have been others, but I don't go crazy on these tips because I'm not greedy and don't want to bring suspicion down on my head. Besides, they keep coming. Darling is a gangster. He lends money, breaks legs, pulls heists, and worse. He tells Honey everything. I hope to write a gangster book one of these days so I keep my laptop on the table during dinner. At times, I'm so busy listening and writing, my meal gets cold. At dinner this evening, I listened as Darling said that he had to leave for a bit and take care of a problem. I have to squash a bug, he says, but I won't be long. And I heard him push his chair back and walk over to the door. I heard the squeak of it opening. I heard a knock on my door. Paul Beckman, kiss, kiss, honey and darling. Well, that brings us to the close of a wonderful evening. I really had such a blast. You're all such wonderful readers, great audience. And um, thank you all. And um so thank you for coming to Paul Beckman's International F-Bomb. And um, in the Zoom room, I'm Francine Witt, um, co-host. And um, see you next month. We do this every month now, right? Well, we've been doing this every month all, all along. So um, see you next month and drive safely. Thank you and good night.